James Frith is a Labour MP for Barry North, the editor of New Brooms, uh, which is written with 11 other Labour MPs from the 2017 intake. James, hello. Hello, Anna. And Isabel Hardman is with us as well, assistant editor of The Spectator, and her uh, new book is still new, isn't it, Isabel? It's only been out a couple of weeks. Yes, week or so, yes. Yeah, it's called Why We Get the Wrong Politicians. Um, so looking at, at slightly different elements of the whole, which is this idea that the Parliament is, is so antiquated in some ways, James, that actually, do, do you think it's having an impact on, on democracy? Yes, I think so. Um, after a year of being in Parliament elected, the new intake, 2017 new intake, decided that we'd offer some constructive ideas to make the place resemble um, a modern workplace, really. Um, arguably, there are immediate and longer term improvements that can be made. Uh, for daily life in Parliament so that we can actually be more effective to change um, daily lives away from Parliament um, with some of the modern practices adopting like proxy, proxy voting or people being able to be on maternity leave and still do their job as a Member of Parliament, but also how we open democracy up, make it more effective and strengthen the public's voice and representation in Parliament uh, with things like a select committee for the Prime Minister to attend that backbenchers uh, through questions submitted by members of the public, um, can be can be posed to the to the prime minister yeah. of the day. It, it's probably worth, and I, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to let you take this task, Isabella. Explain because we talk about proxy voting there as as if everybody understands what it means, but essentially the 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 idea is that if you want to vote, you are supposed to be there in person to do it. Yes, currently, and what we've seen over the past uh, few months is that is pairing, which is the current arrangement, breaking down. So the way MPs who are in the middle of giving birth or are very sick and that sort of thing are able to miss votes is that they are paired with an MP in a similar situation from another party. But the famous example from the last few months was that Jo Swinson, a Liberal Democrat MP, had been told she was paired with Brandon Lewis, a Conservative MP. What then happened was that Brandon Lewis was then told to vote by the Tory whips and Jo Swinson was absolutely furious about this because she was on maternity leave and she'd been assured that she had been paired. So there's been a breakdown of trust on that. Now, proxy voting could be used just for new parents, those on maternity leave, or it could also be used for those who are sick as well, because we've also seen as a result of the breakdown of pairing and whips talking to one another, Naz Shah, who was very sick um, during some of the Brexit votes, being wheeled in from hospital, clutching a sick bucket. So this would allow, I mean, the, the famous phrase is you'd be able to vote from the delivery suite, which I have to say, not all MPs are particularly thrilled at the prospect yes. of sort of giving birth and voting <laughs> at the same time. I can imagine. Well, yes. I mean, this is the thing. As with everything, it's a, it's a balance, I suppose, isn't it? And you, you talk there, James, about when you first arrive in Parliament, and there are so many things to get your head around. What, what did you do before you were an MP? I ran my own small business, a uh, social enterprise that worked with young people. Um, but I think coming from... Uh, private sector or an effective public sector operation um, what struck me and the other um, authors of this of this book is that too often there is too much process not enough product so we spend a lot of time doing protocol a lot of time doing well we've always done it this way and actually not always concentrating on the end product the outcome of what it is we're doing and why for example the debate um, and the argument for proxy voting. We are now on our third debate uh, on proxy voting. Um, actually, what we need is a motion of substance that we vote on and finally decide, which I hope will finally come good in October. Mm. Um, but one of the other things that I'm struck by is the sheer amount of inefficiency of the process. There are 650 MPs. We queue round the block to vote. There may be a series of eight or nine votes up to amendments on a motion um, in the, uh, put to the House. Um, well, 650 people taking 20 minutes to vote. Um, we, we queue round the block to give our name to uh, somebody, one of the clerks, one of the tellers, who puts our name into an iPad. So we queue physically to vote digitally. The argument we're making is, in sub, some uh, instances, uh, that process can be shortened and we can spend more time doing the things that we're sent there to do rather than um, sort of bumping up along yeah. uh, each other trying to vote. But you know that there are an awful lot of people who will say that, that doing certain things in certain ways is important to preserve the history of our grand democracy. Uh, and, and they would hate the yeah. idea of you sweeping 
no, or this is... away with a new broom. Uh, indeed, thank you for getting the, the, uh, the pun in there. That's good. <laughs> that was um, accidental, actually. It, 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 it looked changes. planned, didn't it? Sweeping changes, indeed. <laughs> no, look, uh, this isn't about um, throwing the baby out of the bathwater. This is not wholesale, uh, you know, out with out with one system and in with uh, a brand new or, or replacing in full. It is about adapting, and I think p members of parliament should work in a, a workplace that resembles... Uh, a modern workplace that voters that send us there would recognise, and I think an, ex an example that's been used of, of the, um, the, the the kind of imminent three-line whip reaching the birthing suite, which is uh, what I cover in in my essay. Um, there are there are there are um, uh, circumstances where I think the public expect um, Parliament to adapt to that, as opposed to not being able to do the job you're there to do simply because protocol prevents you. Mm. Um, uh, the reason, Isabel, I was keen to know what James did before Parliament, this is something that you've really looked at in the book, is is the type of person who inhabits the corridors of the, the, the Palace of Westminster, because somebody might sit one day, they might read something on the news, they might be in a coffee shop reading the paper, whatever it is, and if they think to themselves, you know, I quite fancy being an MP, um, it is it's by no means as simple as that. No, it's not. You really have to have an existing political network, whether it's because you've been a party activist for a long time or you're a councillor or something along those lines. So generally you get approached and then you start to work your way through the processes of becoming a candidate. But the biggest problem is that it just costs so much money to stand for Parliament. And James and his colleagues who were elected in the 2017 2017 intake were lucky in some respects because they didn't have to spend two years campaigning before the election it was obviously caused as a, called as a surprise and therefore unlike normal elections where parties embed their candidates for a long time in the run-up to an expected date of an election these guys really just had to launch into it and have two months of campaigning well, I would, without I, any warning i would say actually isabel um i was a 2015 candidate and a number of us were um, I, are, yeah. I, I think I think you are right, though. There yeah. is a, a real... I mean, it isn't just the financial. There is a real emotional toil that um, it takes on, it, particularly if you've got family or commitments um, uh, already. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. There is a there is a significant cost to putting yourself forward um, as, mm -hmm. as, as a candidate. And you're, you're right, the short-term snap general election isn't a bad way to... Um, compared to the two and a half years as a candidate prior to this. Yeah, I'm not um, sure that will be replicated no, any time soon. No. But, I mean, for instance, if I looked at the, 20, the 2015 election for my book. I surveyed 532 candidates from all parties who stood in that. And it cost £11,000 on average, whether you were in a safe seat, a complete no-hope seat as a paper candidate, marginal seat, to stand. And that's of your own money. So that's loss of earnings, that's the cost of renting somewhere... You're working for free. The parties don't pay you to stand. And so that's hugely prohibitive. Now, if you look at the marginal seats where the party actually has a chance of winning, the cost goes up exponentially. For Labour candidates who stood in 2015, if you lost, you still spent £35,000 of your own money. Now, most people just don't have that. And while we do get people from low-income backgrounds coming into Parliament, they've normally managed to leapfrog in some way into a good job before they become an MP just so they can afford to do it and we should definitely applaud those who, who've come who've grown up in poverty and have managed to move on from that who then get into parliament but I think we want people who are working class to be able to go straight into parliament rather than having to sort of save up like it's a deposit on a house for a job interview for a job that they might not get and it I mean it feels a little blindingly obvious that I'm even saying it but of course if you have a, a parliament that only reflects one section of society then how can it possibly make good laws for everybody yes and the points that james and his colleagues have made in their book which is really interesting is that it's not just about who's coming into parliament it's actually how you're used once you're there and i've been really shocked as a political journalist over the last seven years by how much time is wasted, apparently doing a lot, but actually achieving very little, as James says. So you spend 11 to 14 days sitting in something called a bill committee, where you're supposed to be doing line-by-line -line scrutiny of legislation to ensure that it's working. But what actually happens is that committee has a government majority on it. The government MPs are told to sit quiet, vote as they're told, and basically to bat down any objections from the opposition, which means that they're not checking that that law is working 
as it's intended. And so some, some very bad policies get voted through by Parliament with M- without MPs actually realising what's in them and what their implications are until people turn up in crisis in their constituency sur- surgeries as a result of the laws that Parliament's passed. So mm. it's a horrendous vicious circle. I, I can yeah. understand why James and his colleagues feel very dispirited by Parliament because a lot of very bright people come into Parliament and then they're ill-used by it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's worth saying just very quickly at this point, we've got 10 minutes of the programme left. If you have thought about standing as an MP, um, but you couldn't for whatever reason, be it financial, be it social, you didn't know where to start, you didn't know anybody, you couldn't afford it, um, text me now, let me know, 85058, or you can tweet at BBC Five Live. Uh, let me know what's what stood in your way. Uh, James, you were saying? What the, I'm just going to thank you, Isabel, for, for um, agreeing with uh, some of our, our policy suggestions. To, you, to your point about the Bill Committee, I think that's absolutely right. I sat on the Bill Committee recently. The numbers weren't in the room. We had to go through due process on um, a particular uh, bill that we knew the government would carry, that we would eventually support. Um, and there's this theatre. Now, there is some theatre. You know, theatre has a place in, in democracy, of course, but it's one of the reasons why in our, in our book, um, we are calling for a, the introduction of a public evidence stage in the passage of, of new bills so that there is a, uh, an exposure to reality, if you like, um, of some of this. Um, not just the, at the evidence stage, which exists at the moment, but actually um, a, a kind of part of its due process or a bill's due process is to be uh, put in front of members of the public who have either an interest or expertise in this area or simply want to come and make their, make their voice directly heard um, on the issue, um, I think that's really important. Mm. What about the fact as well, Isabel? I mean, and even to hear some of those descriptions, people will find that really impenetrable. Are there any ways to to simplify the processes so that you could potentially become an MP and actually understand what the heck was going on without having spent some kind of, as you say, decent chunk of time in 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 local government or wherever it is beforehand? Well, I think the parties and non-partisan organisations need to approach people who aren't already politically involved and ask them the question whether they've considered standing for Parliament. It was something that Gloria De Piero, who's a Labour MP, discovered when she did a talk called Why Do People Hate Me? to find out why people don't like politicians. That Lots of people, actually, once she'd been talking to them, said, well, I mean, I'd love to stand for Parliament, but where are the job adverts? How do I apply? And it's all sort of shrouded in mystery. I think the parties could also pay their candidates a bursary so that it's not them or their spouse funding their uh, their two years of working for I think free. Right. I think you're right, Isabel. I mean, one of the suggestions I've made to internally um, to the Labour Party is actually there is an argument that rather than funding for organisers to be put into seats, that actually the leadership, the political leadership and the organisation that has to come from the candidate should be funded. Because as, as you ro- absolutely rightly say, um, people that can fund it themselves have to. Um, people that can't fund it don't get the, sh- don't get the shot at it. So um, the party structures need to look at actually how we financially support candidates to enable them to step up and come forward. Otherwise, we're excluding people who can't self-finance. James, what kind of response do you get to this from from fellow MPs, and what what kind of appetite is there for reform? Are you split into to, to say that you're split into two camps makes it sound very simple, but I imagine there's a whole range of views in there, and not everybody is as enthusiastic about it as you are. Yeah, and indeed, even even amongst the eleven authors, we didn't all agree on some of the, each other's suggestions. Politics all over, in, then, isn't in, it? Indeed, uh, look, we we thought it was important to have a constructive voice on reform not reform for the sake of it, but actually to improve the efficiencies of this place and, and, and modernise it. Um, but there are, you know, we, we don't, this is not brand new territory. We're standing on the shoulders of those that have come uh, before us. Uh, the debate around um, proxy leave for uh, for new mums is, is not new, though I hope this can be perhaps part of the, the, the final push and shove for it. Um, but yeah, it does divide. Does divide what, opinion. What line does it divide along? Is it is it is it age? Is it time served in a Parliament? A bit of time is it served. Social background. A bit, a bit of time party? served. A bit of what is reality uh, of what, what is realistic. I think one of the things that to, to the speaker's huge credit, he's been a very reforming speaker, but he was also very candid in the conversations that we had as as candidates in this project uh, with him. You know, he he recognises. Um, he'll he'll be standing down in the next year to, to eighteen months as uh, as per his his previous um, uh, commitments. Um, there will be a speaker's election. So one of the project 
uh, objectives for me for this book was to actually create the stump, if you like, with which the next speaker's election uh, elections are stood on. So we, we've shared our work with the, the candidates that we expect to stand from, from all parties. Um, and we hope that this can be the start of that, of that decision, uh, sorry, that debate rather, ahead of any decision as to who, who becomes the next speaker, mm. building on the reforms that have come. A, a couple of people, Isabella, are texting in about the importance or otherwise of being local. Um, one person says our former MP was funded by a wealthy donor to live in the constituency for two years before uh, the 2010 general election, just so they could develop a public profile and claim to be local when asking for people's votes. And somebody else says here, I stood in a difficult seat. I think it's important for candidates to be rooted in their community. Both parties have a history of parachuting spads or apparatchiks into safe seats. And that, that is, is true to an extent, isn't it? Yes, and I can understand the local argument very much so because you want someone who cares about and is passionate about improving a local community. But just imagine if you are a Labour activist and you are passionate about getting Labour into government and you want to change things, but you were born in Shire, England, in a safe Tory seat that's very unlikely to ever go Labour. I have quite a bit of sympathy with someone who might want to try to set up home somewhere else and make another constituency their home. Now, I think most voters can smell a parachuted candidate um, a mile off, and you've seen candidates before. Actually, Luciana Berger, for instance, got a lot of trouble when she hadn't really read up on Liverpool when she was going for that constituency, but she has now really embedded herself in that area. So I think the local is important in terms of how much you care about your constituency. But it would be a shame to shut people off just because of where they were born and to say that you can't you can't stand anywhere else. Yeah, I'm not sure that would help Parliament either. Yeah, in fact, on that point, um, because I did say, if, you, if you've ever thought about being an MP, what put you off, what stood in your way? There's a text here. It says, I applied to be... Um, a Conservative candidate at the last local election, I wasn't put forward to even the interview stage because I hadn't, quotes, campaigned enough for the party even though I was a local councillor. I'm now so disillusioned with party politics that I've resigned from the party and stand as an independent. And I suppose that's a point as well, James, isn't it, that, that ultimately you have this party system and that controls who even gets to the starting line rather than who gets in. Uh, absolutely, it does. And I think we have to be mindful of those politics or the, the sort of circles within circles. Um, I do think it's, I mean, it, it does always surprise me when there, when there are local elections or general elections and people, people, by virtue of there being an opportunity, decide to get involved in politics. I think, generally speaking, it's pretty rare, uh, certainly the MPs that I work with across party, my own party, and the, the 2017 intake, 2015 candidates, um, I've, I've yet to meet somebody that sort of just thought on, on a whim of a, there being the opportunity to stand, to step up. There's a, always, uh, certainly with, with my experience, there's always a, a history and a kind of pedigree of campaigning experience. Because to be honest, you ain't going to last long as a member of parliament um, if you're not an effective member of parliament. And, and I think there is a new generation of people that come forward with these new ideas, how we use social media, but we're impatient for change. We're also impatient to make an impact and make make the changes we want to see. And that's where this call about, um, you know, too much process, not enough product, mm. actually relentless pursuit of making the changes rather than just making the noise. Yeah. It, Isabel, a final thought here. We've got about a minute left. Will we see change? Because always the... The, the House, by its very nature, you'll have young MPs, you'll have old MPs. It, it, it is not easy to, to push something through that doesn't appeal to everybody. Do you think we are about to see sweeping change, or, or will it just get moved further and further down the line? I don't think we'll see sweeping change. I think that's very difficult. But what's much more effective is what James is recommending, and just to plug my own book, what, what I recommend <laughs> in my book as well, which is changes to the internal structure of the parliamentary system so that you've got select committees which are very good at looking at legislation, taking more power. And actually, that is possible because you don't need a sort of referendum on constitutional change or endless legislative upheaval. You just need enough parliamentarians to believe in parliament and to think that this is important, that they're able to do their job of scrutinising. Now, if we, as James says, if we have a speaker who is minded for more reform, 
that would be great. But we need a lot of MPs in the governing party to ensure that that happens as well. Mm. Thank you both. Really fascinating. James Frith, who's the Labour MP for Barry North, uh, the editor of New Brooms, uh, which he's uh, written with, as he was saying, 11 other Labour MPs from the 2017 intake. And Isabel Hardman as well, the assistant editor of The Spectator. Uh, and her book, as she was saying there, it's, uh, it's only been out for a few weeks. Um, so it's fresh and new, and it's called Why We Get the Wrong Politicians. And thank you, as always, uh, for all of your... Uh, contributions as well. Always appreciate that. Uh, so conference season looming. We'll be in Liverpool for Labour next week, the Conservatives the week after. But I'll see you tomorrow. Here's Nahar.